Amen, somebody. How many of you love the Bible? Come on. Hallelujah. Well, I want to give you four messages on the Bible. And uh, the pastor alluded to it this morning. And if you want to go ahead and bring it, there we go. I want to uh, do a four-part message series entitled, His Book. And I want us to get off of Facebook <laughs> and, and get into His Book, all right? Ain't nothing wrong with Facebook, and uh, I certainly, uh, we use it here, social media. There's nothing wrong with that as long as it's positive, uplift. Anything in our life should glorify the Lord, even our postings. But um, I want to talk to you about the Bible. I want to talk to you because if, if you need direction, I don't know what's coming out of here, but if you need direction, uh, if you need, uh, if your life is not what it uh, needs to be, if you're confused, if you're facing challenges, then the answer is not on Facebook, but in his book. And we're going to answer some questions over, this will be Sunday night, uh, four Sunday nights uh, as, as I have the opportunity to preach. Is the Bible real? Uh, can the Bible be trusted? Now, I know I'm looking at an audience tonight. You, you, you do. You, you trust the Bible. You know the Bible's real. Uh, are there contradictions in the Bible? But I'll tell you something. Your children and grandchildren are no longer, do the, if you ask the average person under 30, do you believe the Bible is completely inerrant, the Word of God, and they may stop and think a minute? Whereas us, we'll say, absolutely. So what about these old so-called other Bibles? And so I want to title this series, uh, or title this series, His Book, and the first message tonight is entitled, Is the Bible the Real Thing? Say that with me. Is the Bible the the real thing. Now, I, since I am preaching to an older congregation tonight, we all remember many years ago the Coca-Cola commercial. You know, Coke, it's the real thing. So I want you to know the Bible is the real thing. I said the Bible is the real thing. And I want us to dust off the old black book. And if you haven't read your Bible through re uh, recently or if you have yet to join in on it this year, at least read the New Testament. I'm going to talk to you about reading the Bible through. But I want us to take a look at his book. Would you stand with me tonight? 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. If you're there, would you say amen? 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. His book. Number one, is the Bible the real thing? If you're at 2 Timothy 3 and 16, say amen. amen. Read it out loud all together. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Read those first two words, all scripture. Father, tonight help us to come to your book, dear God, to get in his book. May it all change our life, and Lord, help us to dust off the Word of God and take up the sword of the Spirit, to quote the Scripture, memorize the Scripture, repeat the Scripture, battle with the Scripture, and I pray tonight you would help us to know that the Bible is the real thing. Make it alive to us, a living, breathing document, and we'll give you the praise. And everybody said, Amen. And turn around and tell somebody, God bless you, and you may be seated. <laughs> His book, say amen. When it comes to the Bible, when it comes to the Bible, there's just a lot of ignorance today. Ignorance just means people just don't know. Uh, Chuck Colson, who was part of the Nixon White House, who later got saved and had a great ministry to prison, he wrote a book called The Faith that I read several years ago. And he, he said in that book that 60% of Americans can't name five of the Ten Commandments. Fifty percent of high school seniors, listen to this, think that Sodom and Gomorrah were married. So there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of ignorance out there. And sometimes it might do good to quiz your teenagers, you know, what do they know about the Ten Commandments? What do they know about the Beatitudes? Uh, could they recite the Lord's Prayer? Could they name three or four, if not all twelve, of the apostles? You know, that's what we're trying to do is learn His book. Amen? It kind of reminds me of a little boy in Sunday school class. and he, he was trying his best to recite the Ten Commandments, but he got a few of them wrong. He said, he said that to his teacher, Moses got the Ten Commandments at the top of Mount Sinai. <laughs> it's Mount Sinai. Oh, y'all got it? <laughs> and then he, he quoted that scripture. It said, honor thy father and mother. He, he quoted it, humor thy father and mother. He got it a little wrong there, and this is the worst one, the one that says, thou shalt not commit adultery. He got it wrong. He said, thou shalt not admit adultery. So 
Don't you know we need to get the scripture right? Amen. Brother Bird, T.L. Bird, who you, you hear me refer to as the, my father in the Lord and mentor when I was younger, uh, he would open his sermons in a unique way. He, he would oftentimes ask the congregation, how many of you want to hear directly from God today? And everybody say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he'd say these words, then open your Bibles. You see, this Bible is his book. And I want you to know he's got a word for you in his book. And I'll never forget that year we were at General Conference. This is probably 20 years ago. I think it was in Kansas City. Pop, no, it might have been Cincinnati, Ohio. But I and my wife and uh, Pastor Jerry and his wife were sitting around a table. We had been to a service that night, and there was a man that was real excitable. And I noticed on the front row he was shouting and praising. I knew he was a very spiritual man, and, and he happened to walk by our table. And I just wanted to say hello to him. And, and uh, I said, how you doing, brother? He said, fine. And he kind of stopped. We don't know each other. And I said, brother, uh, I need a word from the Lord. Give me a word from the Lord. And he just looked a little puzzled, and he said he pulled out his Bible and put it on the table. Do you remember that? 66 books. Hallelujah. We need a word for the hour. And I want you to know the Bible is the real thing. It is the written, plainly written, forever settled, tried, tested, proven word of Almighty God. Somebody praise him that we have 66 books, uh, the, the highway that will lead us to the byways, uh, to lead us to glory way. Somebody say amen tonight. Come on and give him praise tonight. Let's applaud the word of God. Amen. How do we know the Bible is the real thing? Because there are a lot of people asking questions. A lot of people asking questions. Uh, uh, they say things like the God of the Old Testament is not the God of the New Testament. Well, why? Because the Old Testament, they killed those civilizations and stuff like that. And, and what about gay marriage? You know, and people say, one well, Jesus, they say these things. Jesus never said a word about gay marriage. And so, therefore, if he didn't say anything about it, then it must be okay. Uh, they, they come up with all kinds of, you know, there's other things that say it's the Bible. I mean, come on, you people uh, uh, believe the Word of God? Absolutely. Why do we believe it's the real thing? And I've got answers to those questions. What I just threw it up, uh, thrown up to you there just a moment. There are answers to those questions. Number 1.1, 1. 1, the Bible is the real thing because we know it historically. Somebody say historically. I could give you tons of examples, but one in particular is when the Bible said that the walls of Jericho fell down flat. A British archaeologist several years ago discovered the site of ancient Jericho. And he discovered that the walls of the city had indeed fallen completely and that the attackers were able to climb up and over into the city. And in every other circumstance in history and archaeology, uh, when those walls fell, they always fell outward. But in this uh, particular incident, history, uh, uh, not even a Christian archaeologist, discovered and proved historically that the walls came a-tumbling down uh, and God gave the victory in Jericho can you say amen people say well uh how do you know this? I remember this when I was a kid how do you know the Bible's the word of God because you don't have the original manuscripts you don't have the original document that was written by Paul or written by Moses you don't have the original manuscripts how can you say that there that this is the real thing well You've got to understand something. That number one, I don't believe God allowed the original documents to be uh, uh, preserved. Why? I just think we would worship them somewhere. I think we would literally want to touch it because the power is not in the literal physical writing of Paul the Apostle. It's in the God writing through the Apostle. So what did God do? God preserved his word. In fact, to be honest with you, there are over Josh. Josh uh, um, uh, McDowell in that um, book, Re Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Thank you, Josh. He said that uh, there are over 24,000 uh, copies of the original copy. This is a copy of the copy. Now, let me say something to you. If I write down a love letter to Darnell and I say, Oh, dearest honey, I love you with all of my heart. I can't wait to meet you over at Wilson and we're going to go out to eat at Cracker Barrel. And let's just say that somebody copies that message and says, Dear Darnell, I love you. I want to meet you somewhere to eat. And uh, it's over at Cracker Barrel. And then somebody else makes a copy of that. Somewhere in there, uh, one copy to one copy, uh, Dear Darnell, you're... 
you, I do love you, and, some, and I'm hungry. You, know? <laughs> so, you see what I'm saying? I've gone from meeting at Cracker Barrel to, uh, because man kind of deteriorates. You know, when you do a copy, and he does a copy, and he does a copy, sometimes things get messed up. Uh, and if we only had one copy of the original copy, or the secondary copy, the primary copy, then we might can have cause for concern. Is this really the Word of God? But what if I wrote, uh, and there will not one person copying me, but hundreds of people copying me and then hundreds of people copying them we could then compare a hundred copies and where one or two are off we can say well 20 more say this and so we're going to go with the 20 more because obviously the one or two maybe uh, were sleeping during that during that time and not only hundreds but did you know that there are 24 thousand ancient manuscripts of the Bible. That means God has put thousands upon thousands of copies that can be uh, cross-referenced, tested, tried, and proven. How did God do Listen, God preserved His Word. And thousands and twenty-something... Hey, you're not shouting yet. Why not? For example, the only other ancient book of antiquity was written by a Greek uh, uh, author by the name of Homer, H-O-M-E-R. He wrote two classics called the Iliad and the Odyssey. Those were stuff I studied at East Carolina University School of Religion. By the way, they didn't have any religion. just wanted you to know that. <laughs> Did you know, how do we know that Homer wrote those books? And how do we know they're accurate to what he wrote? Do you know what? There are only 600 manuscripts of the Iliad. And of the Odyssey, only 600 have been traced back in antiquity. No other book in antiquity has even that many copies. Most of the books of antiquity have maybe three or four or maybe 10 or 15 copies of the most. So the, the Iliad and the Odyssey, we, they readily believe and they readily have and, and assert this is what Homer wrote. Well, my friend, if they can believe that 600 copies for Homer, how about 24,000 copies of of the Bible, of the Word of God that is true and can be compared. I tell you, it's the real thing. Somebody shout hallelujah. Still not convinced, I see. Well, let me go a little further. So, those copies of copies of copies um, uh, were uh, can be traced back to about the year uh, 700 A.D. That's, that's the earliest copies that we can find or back around the year 700 A.D. And that's all we had. The King James authors of the Bible, those who, who wrote the uh, King James and those uh, uh, Puritans and different ones and leaders, uh, they gave us the 1611 copy of the King James. All they had was those ancient scripts that went back to about the year 700. Are y'all with me? Say amen. So from 700 to about the year 1950, all we had was those, doc those 24,000 documents that were, they were accurate, but all we had was those, and the earliest of those was in the year 700, until 1950. wonder what happened around 1950. A little Jewish boy was throwing a rock in a cave in a forgotten place around a place called the Dead Sea. He heard something crack. He went and investigated, and we discovered even more manuscripts and more copies that were preserved by a great, a strict Jewish sect of about the time of Jesus' birth. And those manuscripts date before the year 700 through carbon testing, through all of that, even today, even more. They were tested to be back to the time of Christ. And they thought, oh my goodness, now we'll know. Do those, do those copies of the Bible we have, are they accurate? Or are these going to say something different? They pulled out the old book of Isaiah and the earliest copy they could find was from the year 700. They pulled out the copy of Isaiah from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, they found one word difference. By the way, Isaiah has 66 books. Come on now. I want you to know historically. Let me tell you, the Bible is not only a book of miracles. The Bible itself in your hand is a miracle book. God has plainly, historically watched over his word. And brother and sister, you got the real thing right here. There's nothing on earth more accurate than the book that you hold. Well, glory, I'm going to shout in your hand. His book, somebody say amen. Well, Glory. The Bible's a real thing historically. 
And number two, what about science? Don't you hear it? Please don't cut on the History Channel and the Discovery Channel. I ought to call it the Undiscovery Channel. They ain't learned nothing. All they, their forte is Area 51 and aliens. They might have it right there. Fiction. <laughs> no wonder our president calls it fake news. Because that's all, it's a lie from the pit of hell. And, and yet it's influencing some of our people and some of our young people. And, and there's the Discovery Channel and the National Geographic Channel and the History Channel. And they come up with the Jesus and Mary Magdalene have an affair. That is called blasphemy. They're on dangerous ground. It is a historical fact that Mohammed had several wives, and his last wife was about nine years old. So you go home and figure that historically. You don't hear much about that, do you? But let me tell you something. Scientifically, well, does science prove the Bible, or science in the Bible is that? Uh, no, science, <laughs> I'm not afraid of science. Pull out a microscope. Pull out a telescope. I tell you, with a telescope, you'll discover God. Pull out a microscope, and in the inner workings of the DNA and the atomic bomb, you atomic uh, the atoms and the and the neutrons and the protons and all of those things. I'll tell you, God is all over science because He created it. Well, for many years, they uh, great surgeons and doctors. The way they treated sickness was to cut you and bleed you um, until somebody who began to study learned of Leviticus 17 and 14 uh, for the life of all flesh is the blood Leviticus um, 7 17 and 14 when a, a man studying and read this scripture he's like and he was a doctor he's like wait a minute we're doing the wrong thing we're we're letting out the life so so they aren't you glad somebody read the Bible do when you go to the doctor next week you might get cut and bled <laughs> and then <laughs> all that money wasted say amen now what about running water Leviticus chapter 15 and verse 13 this was a medical discovery uh, and he that hath an issue uh, is cleansed uh, of his issue then he shall number himself seven days and wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in what water in running water now where are we at brother First, uh, we need to be Leviticus 15, 13. You got 13, 15. So while you're finding it, let me explain. Somebody say running water again. So in the Civil War, uh, they would do surgery, and the doctor would get bloody and messed up. And when he got finished with this patient, he'd run over here to this other patient, and there's the blood from the other patient, and he didn't wash his hands, or he would go to a bowl. Of, somebody say a bowl of water. And he'd wash his hands, and he'd, he'd think he was clean. But somebody read, wait a minute, if you're going to be really clean, you need running water. Amen. I'll tell you what, God can handle germs, infections. And when cleanliness began to come in, in hospitals, I'm talking about as, as much as just a, as little as 120 years ago, there was not cleanliness. People didn't understand uh, bacteria. And, and, and when they discovered those things, they began to realize that running water, that God had a purpose. Uh, he is the scient greatest scientist of them all. Uh, somebody say amen. Hallelujah. Oh, and I love this one in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 21. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 21. And surgery. And many of you have had to have surgery. I know our pastors had surgery before. And, and pastor, I know you are very glad that they put you to sleep during, during the time that you had surgery. Can you imagine being wide awake and them cutting your arm or limb or your chest or wherever you need to go? No, because the Bible says, somebody read in Genesis 2, 21, and the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and took one of his, re he slept and took one of his, God performed the first surgery. When Adam fell, when God put Adam to sleep, he literally cut his flesh, took out an extra rib. We don't know. That's a mystery. <laughs> and he made a woman. And, and the little boy in Sunday school got, went home one night after hearing this, and his side started hurting. And, and Mama said, son, what's, what's wrong? Uh, he said, he said, my side is hurting. He, she said, really, what's the matter? He, he said, I think I'm having a wife. <laughs> oh, anesthesia. Say that, anesthesia. When, when they took my wisdom teeth out, I remember she, she uh, this was like 1990-something, I don't know. But, uh, but they 
they said, we're gonna, you know, they're going to put you to sleep. And I remember she stuck in the vein, uh, and I remember starting to feel woozy and woozy, and boom, I was gone, brother. When I woke up, they did something with them. I don't know what happened. But listen, scientifically, somebody said, let's find, and they discovered anesthesia. Here's another one. I could go on in science. Uh, the round earth. People don't realize it was not Islam. It was not the great Chinese. Uh, and they try to build up the Egyptians and all of the, all of the greatest minds for millennia. All of them thought that the earth was square flat and that everything rotated around the earth. In fact, some of you think that tonight. You think everything rotates around you. My brother and sister, let me tell you, when everything rotates around you, no wonder you can't get things figured out. Can I get a witness out there? I always mispronounce his name. I should know better since I did graduate from college, but Copernicus, Copernicus, somebody. He, Copernicus. That's like Colin Kaepernick, right? <laughs> Anyway, well, that too, amen. But listen, he said, he came up with this radical idea. The earth is round. And that's why Christopher Columbus sailed, because they, that was so radical. But somebody read Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 22. There it is. He that sitteth upon the what? And I tell you, people died. Even the Roman Catholic Church believe that the earth was flat and there's scriptures that seem to allude that the earth is flat but when you take when you look at it in the light of discovery you realize no that's not what exactly what it was talking about uh please understand my friend his book has made the difference historically and is preserved historically and his book is verified scientifically there's not a lab there's not a telescope or a microscope uh, there's not a pain you have or a problem you're going through uh, that somewhere in these 66 uh, books uh, god you take take it back to the source uh, and God is the healer and God is the sustainer he not only created all things uh, he upholds them by the word uh, of his power somebody celebrate his book here tonight Amen. say it with me the Bible is the real thing oh you're still not convinced some of you are quiet let's add more to it prophetically did you know that there's no other holy book. What do we mean? The book Koran, uh, the book Mormon, or any of these hundreds of so-called holy books, none of them have prophecy in them. What is prophecy? It is Prophecy is simply something stated before it happens. Now, this is not intuition per se. I mean, sometimes you can read the tea leaves. Sometimes you can kind of read the signs. And, but you're just kind of, you're bringing a conclusion based on a set of circumstances. That's not prophecy. That's just suspicion or discernment. <laughs> Sanctified is discernment. Unsanctified is we can't go on with suspicious minds. There's a difference between suspicion. Brother Bill, for some reason, everybody's looking at you. I don't know why. I'm suspicious. But listen. Prophecy is stating something, and it's proved by the fact that you have no way of knowing, no way you can orchestrate it, and it comes to pass. If you state something's going to come to pass, say, let's say I prophesy that two weeks from now, um, two weeks from now, so and so is going to uh, win the lottery. Now, wouldn't you love to be that so and so? Well. Don't play the lottery. Anyway, another one. That's another sermon. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, if that so-and-so wins the lottery, then I have prophesied correctly. Say amen. But if I say uh, you are going to win the lottery and two weeks later somebody else wins the lottery, then my prophecy is false. Say amen. The Bible gives 2,000 prophecies within the Bible that have already come to pass. For example, go to Isaiah chapter 45 and 1. This will blow your mind. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 1. Thus saith the Lord uh, to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I've holding to subdue nations before him. Now, when you're just reading through the Bible, that doesn't stand out quite as much as you would realize without further study. You just feel like the, the prophet is talking about a man by the name of Cyrus who's, who God is going to use. But do you realize when you go back and study this passage that Isaiah lived 200 years before Cyrus ever came on the face of the planet? Isaiah 
was not in the same time frame as, and you can, uh, people who've tried to be skeptical to the Bible have tried to come up and try to disprove, and they cannot disprove it. There is, they, then they say, well, Isaiah didn't really write it. Somebody who knew Cyrus wrote it. But then there's about 15 other proofs that Isaiah did write it. The proof of the matter is, that, for example, what if I told you tonight that in the year 2120, that's 200 years from tonight, ain't none of us going to be here. But what if I told you who the, who the president by name would win in that year election? Now, if it happens, then you know my prophecy was true. Oh, let me put it to you this way. Suppose Jonathan Edwards, who was a great preacher of the 17, 1700s, he brought the great awakening, Jonathan Edwards, in, in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, and preached at that great church. By the way, they fired him many years later. But uh, the point is, what if he had written, what if he had prophesied to his congregation, I am telling you that in the year 2016, this is 1750, what if he were to say in 2016, Donald J. Trump will be elected president. Now, if that had happened, we would know for certainty that Jonathan Edwards had heard from the Lord. Say amen. That's exactly what happened with Isaiah. He spoke about a man he had no. He spoke about a kingdom, a kingdom that wasn't even in existence. It was the Persian Empire. The Babylonians were just beginning to come to power. So I'm telling you that the Bible, that's just one of thousands of prophecies within the Bible that have. For what about the prophecies about Jesus? One of the ways we know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is because the Bible, hundreds of years before he was born, told the place, told told what would happen, told how he would die, told that even he would have a tomb borrowed from somebody else, uh, told that he would be born in Bethlehem, uh, told about the wife. Listen, uh, the Bible itself uh, has already proven itself by prophecy in the past within the Word of God that has clearly been. We can go back and say, yes, uh, the Scriptures affirm themselves. Uh, this is His book, uh, and you can build your life uh, on the Word of God prophetically. Well, I'm still not convinced. Maybe somebody manipulated that. Maybe somebody... Well, here's something else the Bible tells us. There's prophecies not only within itself that have come to pass. There are prophecies that have speak of our time that have come to pass since the Bible was written. Are y'all with me here tonight? Let me give you just a few examples. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 37. It says, Behold, I will gather them out of all countries, whether I have driven them in my anger and my fury and great wrath, and I will bring them to this place. Jeremiah chapter 37 was speaking to the nation of Israel, the God's people. He said, You're going to be scattered to the four winds of the earth. But there's coming a time when I'm going to gather you back from all of the nations of the world. That prophecy has been coming to pass in exponential fashion just in the last 100 years. You've got to understand, no other people group, no other people group in the face of human history has been scattered. Most have been assimilated and decimated into other people groups. But the Jewish people is the only family ethnic identity that from prehistory and almost to antiquity, Abraham back then, has kept themselves uh, uh, as a people group. Uh, and why is that? Because God had called them uh, and he said, you're coming back home. Uh, and my friend, in 1900, 100, uh, just say the year 1919, this is 2019, in 19. 19 there were less than 5,000 Jews in the promised land but tonight there are 10 million Jews they now have one of the most powerful nations on the face of the earth you don't want to mess with Israel brother I said, you don't want to mess with Israel. Uh, everybody else will be gone, and they'll be left standing. Uh, Babylon is gone. Rome is gone. Persia is gone. Cyrus is gone. Uh, but the flag furls uh, over Jerusalem. And thank God for the American embassy that's there in Jerusalem. We stand with Israel. Amen. That's a prophecy that came to pass. I'll take this even further. In, uh, in Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 8, I said, who have heard such a thing? Who have seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Shall a nation be born at once? It happened to Israel. One day, they were not a nation. They had been long gone from being a nation status until the United Nations in May of 1948 slapped the gavel and a nation was born in a day. Now let's go to another one. I'm going to bring this to a close 
Revelation chapter 11, verses 8 through 9. This is my favorite. Because, brother, if this doesn't prove, and when you read the book of Revelation, and the things that are described there, it says in Revelation chapter 11, verse 8, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is Jerusalem, which is spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Verse 9, And they of the people, notice this, Kindreds, tongues, and nations shall see their dead bodies. Could have never happened in the years 1800 or before. Bible scholars could not figure this scripture out. Because it's very clear. Now some people said it's going to be like there'll be a bunch of nations and people there at that spot. There'll be an international delegation there at that spot. No, that's not what this means. It says the people of kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their bodies to be put in graves. That scripture has come to pass because we take it for granted. We've got television live from Cairo, live from Jerusalem, even in real time. I'll tell you prophetically, Jesus said that the signs of the time, earthquakes and diverse places. There'll be wars and rumors of wars, floods. As in the days of Noah, the flood of 2004 killed more people than the flood of Noah because of the population of the earth. We are prophetically, this is proving this is his book. And we can believe it. We can rest our weary souls on it. We should preach it. We should proclaim it to our rangers, to our girls' ministries. Uh, and we should sing it in our choir. We should, we should uh, rest uh, and we should preach uh, and we should tell people to get off Facebook as much as to get into his book. Somebody say amen here tonight. Somebody say the Bible's a real thing. Oh, I can tell you about I can tell you about history. I can tell you about scientifically. I can tell you about prophetically. But I know the Bible is the real thing, number four, because personally, I know it's real. I know it's real. I've had its scriptures speak to me direction and confirmation. I can read its pages, and yes, it's speaking to then and it's speaking generally but I'll tell you personally I can tell you personally that God speak not some ancient manuscript not some hole they've dug in the Middle East not what somebody else has said or not said but the greatest proof of the Bible is when you read it and it personally changes your life amen I heard of an old grandmother who lived in an English town many years ago. She lived with one of her sons, but she was too ill to participate much in activities. She would simply sit rocking on the chair most of the day reading the Bible. And often she would doze off for a few minutes with her glasses still on her Bible in her lap. But every day she would talk with a glow about the promises of God that she would find in the Bible. And one day she slipped into a deeper sleep than usual and she just didn't come back. She awoke in that heavenly city, having crossed over to the other side. In fact, she died with her Bible on the lap of her now empty body. Well, that Bible became a treasured family heirloom. Her married son and his wife began to read the Bible, and they were interested in the margins they would find letters, T and P, T and P. And it was always beside some promise. And one day toward the end of the Bible, they found, they decoded what the two letters T and P and in the back they realized what they stood for was tried and proven I got some T's and some P's in this book that I hold up before you tonight the B-I-B-L-E that's the book for me I stand alone on the word of God the B-I-B-L-E we can know the Bible is the real thing historically we can, let me tell you that I, 
I have been, I can say in my life, uh, it's been tried and proven. My great-grandmother can say, uh, and if you picked up her Bible, she could say it was tried and proven. I believe that everyone that's had answered prayer can attest that this book is the real thing because uh, answered prayer means it's been tried and proven. Uh, every drug addict can say it's been tried and proven. Uh, every person sick and healed can say it's been tried and proven. Uh, every comfort at an old graveside, uh, you can shout, it's been tried and proven. Because there ain't no grave uh, going to hold my body down. Somebody say amen. Uh, every soul that's been lost uh, and now is found uh, can shout, that it's been tried uh, and proven. I'll tell you forever, oh Lord, uh, his word is settled in heaven. Uh, you can bank on it, believe it, shout it, proclaim it. It's tried uh, and been proven. Stand with me tonight and give him praise, Brother Clark. Oh, somebody shout, thank the Lord. Somebody give him praise. Somebody give him glory. This is his book. Well, you should have saw what somebody posted about me on Facebook. Well, he already posted some things about you on his book. Well, somebody said something. Somebody, the doctor said that. Somebody said that. What did the Word of God say? Amen. This is the precious. Did you know people for many hundreds of years couldn't hold a Bible in their hand? Have you got your Bible? Pull it out. Hold it in your hand tonight. It's the Word of God. Historically. Scientifically. Prophetically. Personally. And eternally. Forever. Somebody say forever. Oh, Jesus said in John 14 and 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Amen. I said, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by him. That's his book. You can't go by Muhammad. You can't go by Hare Krishna. I just discovered there's a lot of people still believe in Hare Krishna. I thought, man, I, I saw somebody uh, connected with that the other day. You can't go by drugs. You can't go by alcohol, sexual relationships. You can't go by pleasure. You can't go by money. Uh, you can't, you, he said, I am the way, the truth. Eternally. Look at Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. It says, neither is there salvation in any other name. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby they what? They must be saved. I believe if the Lord would send you a text message right now. If you had a, were able to get a text message. You can play softly. I believe if he sent you a text message right now. I believe this would, this would be what it would say. And if you don't know the Lord. He'd send you a text message. And say come unto me. Have you come unto Jesus? You can trust the Bible scientifically, personally, historically, but you can trust the Bible eternally. There's nothing in this world that's going to last, but tonight his word says, come unto me, and you can trust him for your salvation. Well, Brother Ricky, I'm a good person, but your goodness can't save you. It didn't say your name under heaven given among men to be saved. It says his name. And this book tells us how he died for our sins and how he rose again on the third day. So if you don't know the Lord tonight, believe this book. It says, whosoever shall call upon his name shall be saved. Ask him into your heart right now. Come on, everybody, bow your head and close your eyes. Lord Jesus, I pray right now, if there's anyone here tonight that doesn't know you eternally, I'm not talking about knowing about the Lord. You may have had people who hurt you in situations and jobs and issues, but his book is, as our pastor's father said, is a love letter saying, come unto me, come unto me. Oh, what he did for Lazarus, what he did for the walls of Jericho, what he did when he caused the sun to stand still, what he did, all of those in his book is, can be done for you, maybe not literally, but spiritually, God wants you to come unto him. Heavenly Father, I pray right now that we'll embrace, we'll dust off the book. I want you tonight, 
And you can look at me again. First of all, if you don't know the Lord, we want to ask you to come and get saved. Come and get saved. Ask Jesus into your heart. You've got to repent of your sins. You've got to say, I've sinned. You've got to agree what this book says, and Jesus will change you. Not you. You can't come say, well, I'm going to quit this and do that. Yeah, you'll, you'll quit it, but God will do it, not because you're trying to earn it, but because he is going to help you do it. Amen, somebody. Amen. And the second thing I want us to do is, is, is if, if you've gotten dust on your book, you know, go back to that. Uh, see, see, what does that say up there? It says, read me. Somebody say that. Amen. I want you, come on, bring your Bibles down. Everybody, bring your Bible. If you don't have your Bible, bring your cell phone down. Come on and let's, let's read the Word of God. Let's love the Word of God. Let's share the Word of God. Let's, let's get into His book. Come on, come on, everybody here tonight. If you don't know, if you don't know the Lord, or maybe you, you're not reading your Bible, maybe you're not loving your Bible, I don't want you just to read it. I want you to love it. The, the prophet said your words were found, and I did eat them. They are sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. Hallelujah. What sort of things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God's got a word for you, Brother Scholar. You're healed. By His stripes you were healed. Go ahead and sing. I once was lost. Come on, love this book. Oh, God. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the Word. I stand on the amazing grace of your Word. It's the Word of God. It's His book. What's grace that taught my heart to My grace, my fears. I said his book. That grace 